Okay, so good morning, everyone. So we are back to our bioinformatics uh, uh, seminars that, uh, as you know, are organized by the Master in Bioinformatics and the direction of the course and, uh, and the students together with Nebium, our uh, student association, uh, and also by the biosystems uh, group, more, more the bioinformatics and systems biology team uh, of the biosystems group all from in the University of Minho. And the idea is that we can uh, spend one hour uh, hearing about uh, bioinformatics uh, and, and uh, new developments in bioinformatics from um, some colleagues uh, uh, all over the world now taking advantage of these uh, uh, online uh, tools and take, taking advantage of this uh, strange situation of the pandemic. At least we can do something in our, in our favor. Um, so uh, today we, we have uh, uh, João Pedro Magalhães from the University uh, of Liverpool. He has been there for uh, a number of years now and always working uh, towards uh, research on aging with uh, computational and systems biology uh, approaches. And he, he will tell us a bit about the new developments on this uh, fantastic work. So thank you, uh, João, for accepting our, our invitation. Um, and you have the floor to tell us about your, your research. Well, thank you very much, Mickey, for the kind words and being patient. It's, it's a pleasure to bit about some of the work we've been doing in uh, applying computational systems biology and machine learning approaches to aging. Um, so I'll, I mean, I'll start with a brief introduction to, to, to aging and longevity. Um, and then I'll tell you about some of the, the recent projects that we have been involved in um, applying computational approaches. So um, as I'm sure you're aware, we, we, we're now living longer than ever before. So 150 years ago, the, the life expectancy was about 40, 40, 45. So um, now it's over 80. Um, so the life expectancy has nearly doubled in, um, in many countries in Europe and around the world, including in Portugal. So people are living longer than ever before, thanks to every technological progress, thanks to medical advances like antibiotics, thanks to sanitation, thanks to other technological progress. So, um, so there's been a great advance um, in not just technology, but also in civilization that in turn allow us to live longer than ever before, which I think is fantastic. You know, I think this is one of the biggest triumphs of civilization, the fact that we are now living longer and we don't have the, the infant mortality that we had 150 years ago or a thousand years ago. Um, the consequence of that, of course, is that we have an aging population. The percentage of individuals over the age of 60 is increasing. Uh, dramatically um, in Portugal, in the UK, and around the world. It's a, it's a worldwide problem, um, which means we have a high incidence of variety of diseases. So, so we have this graying of the population, we have this aging of the population, uh, and that is one of the major medical, um, social, economic challenges um, of, of the century. So, Let's start with a you know very basic question about what is aging. Um, which, you know everybody's familiar with the process of aging, but I think it is quite striking. Uh, Check centenarians, but of course there's various aspects to aging. There's molecular, cellular, physical changes. So I have a fairly broad definition of aging as a progressive deterioration of physiological function, accompanied by an increase in vulnerability and mortality with age. And that's very broad. It encompasses various facets of aging. But it's ultimate what aging is, which is a deterioration, an increase in vulnerability, an increase in mortality. Um, and the reason we have an increase in mortality, of course, is because of various age-related diseases like cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, etc. Um, now, of course, you're aware we are living in a pandemic. We are, I mean, that's why I'm, I'm talking to you from home. Um, that's why um, I haven't been in Portugal in ages, um, you know, that because we have the, the pandemic caused by COVID-19. And one of the interesting things about COVID-19 is, of course, is that it's a very clear age-related disease. Unlike other, I mean, the, the, the Spanish flu 
pandemic um, roughly 100 years ago, that was not just an age-related disease, that affected young people as well. Um, but COVID-19 is very clearly an age-related disease. So this is data mortality from COVID-19 by age. This is data from China, but data from other countries is very similar. And what you see is the very low mortality in young ages. Now, children, unlike uh, other infectious diseases, uh, tend to be very rarely affected by COVID-19. Um, so mortality, I mean, children can die of COVID-19, but it's very rare. They need to have other underlying medical conditions. So children are very rarely affected seriously by COVID-19. And up until about the age of 40, 50, COVID-19 is not normally or is really a problem. Or, uh, but after the age 50, it, it, then it's when it starts to increase. So the mortality for COVID-19 starts to increase after roughly age 50. And then it increases a lot, as you can see. Um, so there's a very clear age-related pattern to COVID-19. It is a disease of old age. It is a disease that affects typically elderly individuals. Um, and I mean, this is not unexpected. There's lots of other infectious diseases that, have, that fit, typically affect older individuals. But I, I think it's important to emphasize that the reason we, we, we have the pandemic or the, the COVID-19 is a problem is not just because of COVID-19, it's because our aging process. I mean, if we didn't age, COVID-19 would not be a problem. Um, so there are changes, physiological changes, molecular, cellular changes that lead to this, lead to this increase in mortality with age. And that's what we like to discover. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what those are. Um, we don't know at the level of even the immune system, uh, what are the drivers of, of immune system aging? Why does our immune system work or doesn't work as well in older ages? We, we don't know. Why is COVID-19 more lethal in older individuals? We don't know. Um, taking a step back, why we age? Again, we don't know. So we don't understand well the drivers of aging, the molecular mechanisms that drive, that cause the, the, the process of aging. But there are some hypotheses and I'll change some of those and, and there's been advances. But it's important to, to keep that in mind. We don't understand the process of aging at the mechanistic level yet. We don't understand why humans being age, including the immune system. Um, so, so that is a problem, I would say. Um, on the other hand, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a large amount of data now that is being generated. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll touch upon some technologies in my talk. Uh, but the point is, I mean, this is a computational biology group, so I feel like I'm pretty to the converted, but, you know, really the bottleneck of research now is not so much in generating data, is in analyzing data. That's, that's what we need. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to, to generate large amount of data. It's not so easy to analyze them. So really, analysis, interpretation, that is really now the, the, the bottleneck of research. That's what we need to do. Now, uh, historically, I was, so I actually, I, I got a degree in microbiology in Porto, um, and then I got a cell biology PhD. So I used to be an experimental biologist. But once I finished my PhD, I realized this. I realized really that um, there's been a shift in the way we do research. We're no longer just doing experiments in the lab. We, we're generating massive amount of data that we have to interpret. That's really where the future is. So I did a transition from an experimental biologist uh, which I was until I finished my PhD to a computational biologist. Uh, and that was a very good decision, I think, in my, in my career, um, because that really has allowed me to be involved in a portfolio of, of works and projects that would if I was just doing experiments. Um, and so my lab now in Liverpool, the Integrative Genomics of Aging Group, we, we still do experiments. So we do a combination of experimental work and computational methods. I have a few... Uh, PhD students that, that do experiments in the lab, mostly cell biology experiments. We've done some work in C. elegans as well. I'll, I'll briefly mention in one of my slides. Um, so, and we do a lot of collaborative work as well, uh, doing experiments. Uh, and then we do a lot of bioinformatics from systems biology, machine learning, evolutionary analysis. So we do various kinds of, of computational um, systems machine learning analysis. Um, and so, I mean, today I'll, I'll focus on that. I'll, I will briefly mention here and there some of the experiments we did, uh, but mostly I'll mention, I'll talk about the work we have done at the computational and, and, and the systems biology machine learning level. 
Uh, I won't go into a lot of methodological details about our projects, you know, statistics and so on, but, you know, m most of what I'll talk has been published or, you know, it's a preprint. So um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions later. So, but, you know, we're just taking a step back um, to arguably the most important discovery in the biology of aging, which is the, the discovery that the process of aging is, is plastic. In, in animal models. So these are C. elegans, uh, so tiny round worms, um, very tiny animals. And uh, that they, they only live normally a few. Uh, and what we know what's discovered back in 1988 was that a single gene manipulation in these animals can significantly affect their lifespan. So you can take these animals and they live significantly longer. Uh, and that really led to a revolution in our understanding of, of genetic basis of aging, because it shows that the process of aging is plastic, it can be manipulated. Um, and since then, there's been lots of studies in other animal models as well. Um, and actually, so I've always been fascinated by this, by this ability of tweaking a single gene and extending lifespan. So back when I was a PhD student, although I did my PhD, as I said, in cell biology and cellular senescence, so doing experiments in the lab, kind of as a side project, I started this human aging genomic resources. So a collection of tools and databases for, for research on aging, which since then have grown to be the, you know, without false modesty, the benchmark databases in the field with hundreds of thousands of visitors, hundreds of citations. Uh, amongst this is the, the genage database of aging related genes. And this is the benchmark database of genes associated with it really illustrates how much we have advanced uh, in terms of our understanding of the genetics of aging. So this is the, the, the latest version of our database um, and really shows you know, how we've advanced um, what we call gerontome, really how we now know of over 2000 genes in different model systems impact on aging. So, um, so in worm alone, there's nearly 900 genes that impact on aging. So these are individual genes that if you knock them out, you silence them with overexpression or mutate them, you do some type of genetic manipulation and it significantly uh, modulates aging, typically increases lifespan. Although you can also uh, shorten lifespan in, some, in some, some models, in particular in mice. And the record is a tenfold life extension. That's a single gene manipulation that in, tweaks the worms. And instead of them living a few weeks, they're living for several months which is incredible. Now, of course, in mice, um, okay, worms are too simple. You know, mice are more complicated. But even in mice, we know of over 100 genes in mice that can um, impact significantly on aging, either by accelerated aging or tarding aging and increasing lifespan. And the record is a nearly 50% increase in lifespan. Okay, now not much as worms, but it's still very impressive. I mean, if we could tweak a single gene and increase human lifespan by 50%, I mean, that'd be incredible. We'd be living 150 years. And it's important to point out that these animals, when you change a single gene and they're living longer, they're not just living longer with poor health. No, quite the contrary. They're living longer in good health. You know, they still, of course, age and die, but they develop age-related diseases later in life. So the process of is slowed and their life and health span ex extended. So they, they're living longer with good health, like having a 70 year old with the health of a 50 year old. So that's, that's quite important. And that's what I would like to do in human beings. Um, so, okay, so this is quite remarkable. We have this knowledge of the genetics of aging uh, that's really exploding in the past 20, 25 years. But of course, genes don't work isolated. They have to they interact with each other and with each other. So we've been doing various analyses. I'll, I'll briefly mention um, a couple of analyses we've done in the context of gerontome. So again, I won't go into a lot of details. This was a paper we published a few years back already on a systematic analysis of gerontome. It was led by Medea Fernandez, a Portuguese uh, master student in a lab, um, who is now, now doing a PhD, I think, in Luxembourg. Um, so one of the things we did so was, okay, so you have all those genes, you know, can we group them into different pathways that act in different ways? So we classify them. So first of all, we classify the genes as pro or anti longevity. Um, so a pro longevity gene would be a gene that you know you activate and it increases lifespan, or if you disable, it decreases lifespan. And anti longevity would be the, the opposite. 
uh, and then allows you to, to identify which pathways, which mechanisms are important for anti and pro longevity in different model systems. So in mice, for example, you have pro longevity, cell cycle regulation, P53, anti longevity, things like growth on insulin signaling. Um, so, for example, in worms, you'd have as pro longevity autophagy um, and anti longevity oxidative phosphorylation and mTOR signaling, which, well, we actually know is involved in, in uh, longevity regulation. So the point is that this allows us to go from 2,000 genes to, to reducing the complexity and focusing on particular mechanisms and pathways. So that's one of the analysis that we've done. Now, the other light type of analysis at the level of interaction is disease. Um, I'll show you one example. We've, uh, we've done this for various diseases, but I'll show what we've studied the most is cancer, actually. So we know cancer is an age-related disease. Incidence of cancer increases with age. But why is that? Now, clearly mutations play a role. You have an increase in the number of mutations with age. But there's other factors um, that play a role as well, like hormonal changes, vascular aging, senescent cells, uh, changes in the immune system, inflammation, and so on. So we've been exploring this in various different ways. Um, I'll show you again. I'll show you one example uh, of the type of analysis we've been doing. So we look at transcriptomes from aging, uh, senescence, and cancer. So we, we use the GTX data set to look at age-related gene expression changes with age in various tissues. And then we use the TCGA data to look at cancer gene expression uh, changes, again, in various tissues. We also look at senescence, but I'll talk about senescence in a few minutes. Um, so these are tissue-specific data. OK, and then what we did is we matched with, OK, so how are changes in aging related to changes in cancer? And the hypothesis is that, OK, so with aging, we have an increase in cancer. And, you know, there's going to be some changes in gene expression that's going to be related to cancer. At least that's what our hypothesis was. But actually, it turns out that's not the case. Actually, what you see in cancer are changes in different directions. In other words, in a particular tissue, um, let's say um, the brain, uh, you have, or the liver, you have changes in gene expression during aging going in one direction, and those changes tend to go in the opposite direction during cancer. So that's something that we observed. I, I actually, I said I was a little surprised about it. Um, although when you start to think about it, it may make some sense because you see changes at the cell cycle regulation level when you do things like uh, functional enrichment. So in aging, you see a decrease in cell cycle you know, cells don't divide as much. While in cancer, actually, it's quite the opposite. Cells divide a lot, right? And also in terms of the immune system, you see um, uh, changes that go in, in opposite directions between cancer and aging. Now, there are exceptions. Um, the thyroid and the uterus are exceptions. You see changes in the same direction um, between cancer and aging. But for most tissues, this is the case. Um, and I mean, th this has a lot of implications I don't have time to go into regarding uh, um, the, the evolution of cancers. So, you know, the question is, okay, are these changes detrimental or beneficial to cancer? My initial thought was these are detrimental, actually, to cancer. You have these changes during aging that become detrimental to cancer. But, I mean, I, I, you know, James Gregory, for instance, who, who's, who's uh, quite interested in these topics, is made the argument. But actually, no, changes are beneficial because it creates a tissue microenvironment for cancer. Aging creates a tissue microenvironment for cancer. Uh, for example, fewer cells replicate. So when you have a cancer clone, that one, it becomes a more fertile environment. So he thinks they're beneficial. I, I think, you know, I think the jury's still out of that. But there's various evolutionary, well, implications about how cancer evolves the tissues uh, about this, um, these results. Uh, Jean, so, sorry for interrupting, but we have some cuts in the sound. Maybe it's related to the microphone. It doesn't seem. Um, I can try the computer microphone. That's that's what I can do. Yeah, that's so, what I was thinking because maybe it can improve because it doesn't seem to be the connection. So, give me one second. Uh, um. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, it seems to be better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll try with the, the computer microphone then. 
Um, so, uh, so these were some of the analysis we did on cancer. Now, the other topic which relates actually to cancer and aging is cell senescence. So senescent cells are basically cells that should be dividing, but they stopped, irreversibly stopped dividing. So normally, you know, cells, well, not all cell types, but you have cell types like fibroblasts that will divide in culture and in, uh, in organs, but they can, because of uh, various reasons, they can become senescent. That means they stop dividing. And the hypothesis is that uh, during aging um, and during stress, you have an accumulation of senescent cells in tissues. And these senescent cells also secrete inflammatory cytokines uh, that in turn contribute to, to inflammation and dysfunction. There's a lot of interest in this topic. Um, you know, there's various companies um, developing senolytics, that is, drugs that target senescent cells specifically. So, uh, um, so, so it's a very timely uh, topic um, of research. So it's, it was actually what I did my PhD on, uh, and we've decided to take also a systems computational uh, uh, biology approach to it, which I'll, I'll briefly summarize. So the first thing we did, we, we did a database. I mean, we have various databases. I don't have time to go into all the databases we have, the database of drugs association with longevity that I, I, I won't really go into much detail. Um, and we decided to make another database called CELLAGE, a database of genes associated with cell senescence. So this is based on uh, genetic manipulations. Um, so, you know, it's a bit like gene age. These are genes, when you have a gene that if you genetically manipulate it in human cells, that accelerates, induces, or prevents cell senescence, then that would be a gene associated with, with, with cell senescence. So that would be a gene that we'd include in, in cellage. And uh, the first version has 280 genes. We have a new version we're working on that has more genes, but that, that's not online yet. Um, and these are actually some photos of senescent cells from my PhD. So these are young fibroblasts and these are senescent fibroblasts. As you can see, senescent fibroblasts tend to be more morphologically distinct. You have, you know, small cells, big cells, you know, elongated cells. It, it's much more uh, heterogeneous. Now, and based on the type of manipulation and the effect it has on cell senescence, we can classify cell senescent genes as promoting or inhibiting cell senescence. Um, okay, so we made this database available online, and then we did various analysis again. Um, I, I, don't have time. Oops, don't have time to go into all of them. But one of them, I'll show you a couple of analyses we did. One of them was looking at cell senescence genes during normal aging, which is what you see here. So these are various human tissues, and then we have genes that inhibit cell senescence and promote cell senescence. And as you can see, in genes that promote cell senescence, you do tend to see a <clears throat> overrepresentation of genes overexpressed with age. <clears throat> Um, as compared to genes underexpressed with age. So in most tissues, but not all, you see these genes associated with cell senescence being overexpressed with age. Now there are exceptions. The uterus again is an exception, like we, we, we observed in our uh, work on, um, on cancer. The uterus is an exp exception. Um, there's potential reasons for it. We're actually collaborating with colleagues at the Women's Hospital here in Liverpool to study why this happens. Uh, but in most tissues, we do see uh, gene expression signatures of the senescence uh, increasing with age. <clears throat> then we also did various functional uh, network analysis. So, um, I mean, I'm sure many of you are familiar with network analysis, but basically uh, we can build networks of, of well, co-expression and protein interactions that, that give you insights. Um, one analysis that you can do very simplistically is looking at guilt by association. So if you have proteins, that have not been studied in the context of, say, a phenotype like longevity, that interact with a lot of proteins associated with that phenotype, then these are more likely to be associated with that phenotype. Uh, and that's something we've done for various processes. I mean, we did uh, this analysis a, a few years back where we look at candidates in yeast that mediate life extension or diet mediated life extension. Uh, we showed that was the case, I, I don't have time um, to go into details now, but basically we showed in various previous articles and studies that we did that we can use this guilt by association to identify new candidates associated with a phenotype like longevity uh, or aging. So 
the other thing that we've done, um, actually, this was initially, initially we tend to use protein-protein interactions. I'm actually growing more fond now of co-expression interactions. And we, um, one of the reasons for this is because we've developed a tool for, for co-expression network analysis. And well, <laughs> I blame a former PhD student in my lab called SIPCO for getting me interested in co-expression networks. Um, so this was a tool, again, I don't have a lot of time to go into, but I mean, there's a paper, actually you have a preprint on, on, on this new version of our GeneFriends tool, but basically this is a whole genome co-expression map. So we look at over 80,000 transcripts and then we make a map of how strongly they co express with each other based on all of the data we could get our hands on. So we got thousands of data sets. Uh, at the moment, we have human and mouse co expression maps. Um, and so we have thousands of data um, points. And so we basically just data crunch all of this data and we make a map of how strongly genes tend to be co expressed with each other. And the hypothesis is that genes that are co expressed with each other tend are more likely to be functional related. So we can use this tool. Uh, for example, if we have a seed list of genes associated with a phenotype, we can use it based on this guilt by association principle for identifying new candidates in terms also associated with that seed list of genes. And likewise, if you have a particular gene or non-coding RNA that is unstudied, if you look at its co-expression patterns, you can infer some of its functions. Uh, and that's something we've done in the context, particularly in the context of cancer in the past. So, so I mean, again, I won't, don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but I invite you to, to visit our website. And as I said, it, it, it works well with some phenotypes and diseases, um, doesn't work for all genes, but so it works better with some genes than others, depending on their expression patterns. Um, but if there's a particular gene or process or phenotype of interest, I, I invite you to try out our, our tool. So going back to cell senescence then, okay, so we have this co-expression data. So we build this co-expression network of cell senescence, which is what you see here. So we take the genes associated with cell senescence and look at their interaction patterns. And then we, we make um, a network uh, of those interactions, which is what you see. So as you can see, there's different clusters and we can do functional enrichment of these different clusters. And the process associated with cell senescence are well, mostly things you'd expect like cell division, DNA repair, and immune system, um, et cetera. So you can look at these different clusters and see which functions tend to be overrepresented. And then what you can do is you can also use different approaches to identify new candidates. So again, I'm skipping a lot of details, but I mean, we published this paper last year in genome biology. So all, all of the statistical and methodological details and various results I'm skipping will be there. But basically we do this um, network analysis, and then we try to identify new candidate genes based on identifying hubs in the network. So uh, you know, hubs would be you know, genes that will connect, that are connected, in this case, co-expressed with many other genes, uh, bridging regulators, there would be genes that, that connect different parts of the networks. So we, we perform these various network analysis. We also integrate data on gene expression for cell senescence that that I don't have time to go into detail here, but basically we do these various integrative analysis and we identified 26 candidate cell senescence genes. And then we tested them experimentally in collaboration with, with Cleo Bishop in London. Um, and it was interesting that, uh, so what you see here are all the genes we tested. I mean, this is a positive control and these are markers of senescence. Uh, and as you can see, most genes, when you manipulate most of our candidates, they have some effect on cell senescence, at least on some markers. So of the 26 genes we tested, most of them were actually pan out to have an impact on cell senescence. So six of them could be classified as strong hits, that is genes that have a strong impact on multiple markers of senescence. And there were 12 moderate hits as well. So clearly this shows that we can use this computational network biology approaches to identify new genes uh, associated with cell senescence, regulating cell senescence, which I think was uh, quite a good a proof of concept of, of this approach. So the, the other thing we've been um, working on is uh, applying DNA sequencing um, to study aging and, and longevity. I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been massive advances in, in DNA sequencing technologies and generating data. I mean, this is um, 
me pretending to work with that machine. Um, but I mean, what I know is that, you know, there's been this huge exponential increase in our capacity to sequence DNA, which is what you see here. Uh, so this is a log scale and the cost of genome sequence has dropped dramatically, as I'm sure you're aware. So we've been applying this technology of DNA sequencing to, to study aging longevity. And I'll show you a couple of different projects we've been involved in, again, without going into a lot of methodological details. So one project is focused on this animal called the naked mole rat, which, which is what you see here. And we're interested in, in these animals, not just because of their good looks, uh, but also because of their longevity and cancer resistance. So these are relatively small animals. So they're slightly bigger than a mouse, slightly smaller than a rat. So they're rodents. And they're the longest they've grown it. They can live over 30 years, which is remarkable because mice and rats can only live about three or four years. And they're also very cancer resistant. Um, there's been a few cases now of cancer in these animals, but uh, it's still very low cancer incidence, given that there's been thousands of animals kept in captivity, the cancer incidence is very low. So we sequenced the genome of these animals and we created this resource called the Naked Mole Rat Genome Resource. Um, for others to, to study the, the naked mole rat genome. The other animal we've been focusing on is the, uh, well, there's a couple more, but another animal we've been focusing on is the bowhead whale. And this is the second heaviest animal in the world. It's, it's been estimated to live over 200 years. And so, um, and they should also be cancer resistant because if you imagine, you know, these animals that have a thousand times more cells than humans, you know, how can they live so long? They must have some natural mechanism to, to suppress cancer. So we sequence the genome of, of this animal. Again, I'm, I'm not going into methodological details, but then we look for gene candidates or mutations specific in a bowhead whale in cancer and aging related genes, for which we found some interesting promising candidates. Um, so what you see here, for example, is this multiple alignment where you see various species and very specific um, mutations, changes in, um, in residues, uh, well conserving other animals, but there are very specific, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to the bowhead well. And then we can also, we also made predictions. So these are our protein models. It's a particular protein called ERCC1, which is involved in DNA damage responses and cell cycle regulation. Um, and this in red, you'll have the, the residues that are mutated in this protein in the bowhead whale. Um, and we think it affects the interactions where we predict computationally uh, based on 3D models that it affects the interactions of this protein with another protein called FAN1. It's also associated with cell cycle regulation in cancer. So what we can say is that we can make these pre computational predictions. Of course, we cannot go to whales and actually test them unfortunately, but we can make these computational predictions of changes specific uh, in the bowhead whale that affect, that we think may contribute to their longevity and cancer resistance. Uh, and we made a database as well. We made a resource called the bowhead whale genome resource. I, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm very, you know, big advocate of open science and, and sharing. So I, you know, I think I want everybody to work on naked mole rats or bowhead whales. Um, and I see this as complementary paradigms in biomedical research. Well, a lot of people, well, most research is focused on models of disease like mice, rats, et cetera. Um, and that's, you know, that's fine. Um, we focused on disease resistant organisms that I think are complementary because they will allow us to identify genes and processes that protect against disease as opposed to genes and processes that cause disease, which I see it as a complementary approach in, in biomedical research. Um, now, more recently, and just very quickly, we've also sequenced the genome of the capuchin monkey. We've just published this a um, couple of months ago in PNAS, together with, with various collaborators. Uh, and the capuchin monkey is quite interesting because it's after human is the best example of a long-lived primate. So I don't know if you've ever seen capuchin monkeys, it's small. If you've ever seen Indiana Jones and, uh, well, the first Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's a capuchin monkey in there. So they're quite relatively small, but very smart monkeys. And they can live over 50 years. So there's an evolution of longevity and intelligence in these animals, just like you see in the human lineage. So we've done, again, various analysis, uh, and we identified candidates uh, for longevity 
uh, evolution in these animals by doing various you know, molecular evolution analysis, candidates for selection. Uh, so we did various analysis. And again, I won't go into details, but this has uh, been published recently in PNAS. So uh, in the last uh, few minutes, I just want to touch a, a different topic we've been focusing as well. And I mean, again, one of the advantages of these computational approaches is that we can work from home. And I mean, the pandemic has been very disruptive to the work we do in the lab and to my PhD students that work in the lab, um, but, and, and, and colleagues, uh, my colleagues who do mouse experiments and so on has been very disruptive. But certainly for computational analysis, it's not such a, a big problem. Uh, and we've been very productive um, actually this, this, this year during the pandemic. Um, and so in terms of computational analysis, there's one more angle I would like to focus on. It's the level of um, um, drug discovery. So, okay, because I'm interested not just in understanding aging and its genetics, but I'd like to develop products uh, that, that have an impact. So one of the things we've done, uh, again, we published this a few years back, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, is uh, network pharmacology approaches for drug repurposing. So we know that there are gene expression signatures of aging and longevity. And as I'm sure you're aware, there's gene expression signatures of drugs as well. So we basically, in this project, we basically look for the overlap between them. Are there drugs that induce similar or overlapping gene expression signatures to Longevity, for example. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we found quite a few. And we actually did experiments in C. elegans. Um, don't have time to go in detail, but there were five drugs we tested experimentally in C. elegans, four of which extended lifespan. So we can show that this is, that we can use this natural pharmacology methods to identify new compounds extending lifespan, including, well, Elantuin was a particularly interesting one uh, because nobody had studied it or, or in the context of aging although it's already used in some anti-aging skin creams. So, so I thought that was quite intriguing. Um, so, I mean, we published this in 2016. I, I won't go into details, but it shows that we can use these network pharmacology approaches to identify new drugs associated with longevity, uh, which we then tested in C. elegans. Um, and I mean, more recently, we've been focusing on some of the mechanisms um, uh, of these this compounds and the lantern in particular. Um, <clears throat> Now, in this context, we've also been employing machine learning approaches. Um, I mean, I won't go into, to, again, to a lot of details. We did this review on applying machine learning to aging research. Uh, we've been doing quite a lot of machine learning predictions for predicting new genes and compounds in the context of, of longevity. So employing features of genes and compounds, uh, known genes and compounds associated with longevity and aging from our databases and trying to discover unstudied genes and compounds uh, that have those features. So that, that's something we've been doing quite a lot. Um, and I'll show you one quick example, which is applying machine learning to, to cognitive aging. So this is in collaboration with Alex Freitas in Kent, my, my long-term collaborator in, in applying machine learning. Uh, but basically we wanted to predict new genes associated with cognitive function in aging. <clears throat> So, so what we did was, okay, so we looked at features of existing genes associated with cognitive function, taking various lines of evidence, including, we don't have time to, to go into it in detail, but genetic studies, uh, gene expression, et cetera. Uh, and then we made some predictions using machine learning for new genes associated with, with cognitive function and aging. Uh, then in collaboration with Ian Deering in Edinburgh, uh, they looked in some of the data. Uh, so this is epidemiological human data um, and of the 10 genes they tested, one of them is a potential new hit for a genetic association. Um, so again, this shows we can employ our computational in silico methods, in this case, machine learning for making computational predictions, which you can then test uh, in, uh, in real life. Well, you, you know what I mean? In, uh, in real life examples, in this case, human epidemiological data. Um, and I think that's something that is it's quite timely and important with this incorporation of human data, which is something we've been doing more and more. I mean, we have another database called Longevity Map, a, a database of human genetic association studies of longevity. Um, and so we're moving just from um, studies in model systems to, um, to incorporating human data. So for example, we've been using a lot of data from uh, uh, UK Biobank, 
and the, the Framingham Heart Study data. So this is epidemiological data and genetic data that we can then use for making genetic associations with aging phenotypes, for you know, studying multimorbidity, for studying aging diseases. So that's something we've been doing a lot. And we also can take some of the findings we're doing computationally from model system all the way to humans. So one example is, so I told you about these network pharmacology approaches. So we do computational analysis, and then we make predictions of drugs, okay? That affect that life extending drugs, longevity drugs. And then we tested them in C. elegans, okay? Five tested, five drugs we tested, four of which uh, extended lifespan. But that's worms, you say. Now, if I had enough money, I would go into mice as well. I would like to test some of these drugs in mice. Um, but that's quite expensive. I don't have the funds to do that. Um, and you know, you could even say, well, okay, even if it works in mice, how do we know if it works in humans? So we established this collaboration with Tim Spector in King's College, London. And what we're doing is we're looking into patients that take some of the drugs we identified, because some of them are approved for clinical use, uh, although not aging, but specific diseases, and looking if these individuals um, have um, higher or lower epigenetic age. So if, if people who take some of the drugs we think extend lifespan have a higher or lower epigenetic, well, ideally lower epigenetic age than would be expected for their chronological age. Um, and that would be a way of validating what we're discovering computationally all the way in humans. And that's something that I think it's, it's crucial now because I think as a field of aging, we've advanced a lot in model systems, but not so much in human intervention and human knowledge. So really, what, what I want to do more now, what we're doing focusing more is incorporating human data. And ultimately, of course, what we want, what, what I would like is to intervene in aging, is to develop an intervention that slows down the process of aging, retards age related diseases, and makes people healthier uh, for longer. So that, that's, that's the ultimate goal. Um, I, in that context, there's been really a, a big growth in the anti-aging biotech sector. So you might have heard this was uh, some years back, but Google invested over $2 billion in, in a company called Calico. So that's arguably the most famous company working on the anti-aging field. Uh, but there's others like, yeah, well, Juvenescence here in the UK, Unity Biotech, they focus on senolytic drugs, so drugs that target senescent cells. One of their investors is Jeff Bezos, um, wealthiest man in the world from Amazon. So there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of growth in the anti-aging biotech sector thanks a lot to these discoveries in model systems, genetics of aging, uh, and so on. Um, but now the challenge is to translate it to humans. Uh, and this, I mean, this is my disclaimer of, of various companies I work with. Now, there is one company I wanted to, to, to just mention briefly, and that is Centaura. So this is a company of which I am the, the CSO, the Chief Scientific Officer. Um, and uh, so we're based in Switzerland, uh, but we have um, a lab in, in Moscow and also in just opened a lab in, um, in Boston. And the idea for Centaura is that, okay, there's lots of companies focusing and what attracted me to it is that there's lots of companies doing pharmacological approaches to aging um, and that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> but Centaura takes a more radical approach. So the idea is to develop technologies like gene therapy and we have a, a project on artificial chromosomes, develop the technologies that you know, allow us to reverse aging, not just slow down aging, but reverse aging. So that, that is the technologies uh, that we are developing to make that possible. Uh, so of course it's high risk, but you know, it's, it's also a high reward, it's a classical high risk, high reward approach, quite excited about. Um, so, I mean, if they're interested in you, please visit our website. And I should also say that we're trying to recruit a, a bioinformatician for Centaura. So if anyone is, is interested, please feel free to drop me an email. Um, so, <clears throat> in summary, um, well, I hope I persuade you, I mean, I, I think this group is not very difficult to persuade, but I hope I have persuaded you that computational approaches are essential for modern biological, biomedical, clinical research, because of all of the amounts of data that are being generated. Um, in the context of aging, um, that is true as well. Uh, I mean, we have, we know of over 2000 aging rated genes, like we have in our genage database. So really the challenge now is to make sense of all of the data that's being generated. 
uh, I hope I convinced you of network analysis that they can lead to new insights, new genes, new processes, new drugs associated with given phenotype. And of course, we've done a lot of studies on senescence, saging, longevity, but a lot of these approaches can, can be applied to various different processes uh, and diseases. Uh, I showed you of our studies of cell senescence gene networks and how these can lead to identifying new genes associated with cell senescence, which we then tested experimentally, we validated experimentally. I briefly mentioned some of our machine learning methods or applying machine learning to, uh, to study the genetics of aging, um, which is something we're doing quite a lot in, in various contexts. I told you about the use of long-lived species to find genes that protect against aging. Uh, and lastly, I told you about integrating human data into our analysis, which is something we're doing a lot, also in the context of machine learning, applying machine learning to, to, to large human data sets, something we're doing uh, increasingly, like UK Biobank. Um, and we're really going from you know, model systems and, and um, you know, genetic aging in model animals that we've advanced a lot, all the way to really intervening in human aging, which is, um, which is the my ultimate goal. So with that, um, uh, I'd just like to thank my lab. I mean, this is a photo of course before the pandemic um, when we could still go in the lab. So um, these are, are the people who did the, the various projects that I, I told you about. Um, I would emphasize Roberto as he, he, he worked a lot on the, um, the cell age database and the cell senescence analysis that I mentioned. Um, and also various people like, uh, like Zoya and, and Ines, also, she also a Portuguese uh, bioinformatician in our lab that worked on, a, on our various um, databases. Um, and also should emphasize Cassid here, who did the analysis of uh, the overlap between cancer and aging that I, I told you about previously. Um, so yeah, so these are the people who did all of the work that I told you about. I'm really just a, a PR <laughs> spokesman for the lab. They did all, all of the work and these are the various funders uh, that paid for all of the work that I told you about. Um, so thank you very much. And I mean, if you're interested, of course, please feel free to, to check out our website. You know, all the, the, the works that I mentioned, we got PDF reprints uh, or preprints in, in, in our website. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to drop me an email. And uh, thank you for your time and attention. Okay. Thank you, Siobhan, for the very interesting uh, talk. So lots of interesting work here. So I will uh, open the floor to any questions, uh, either by chat or if you want to, to put them in person. <laughs>